This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Welcome to the Craft Beer and Bring podcast. I'm your host, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Bring magazine, Jamie Bogner. And I'm here again for this second of our Best in Beer podcasts with Craft Beer and Brewing Managing Editor Joe Stang. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. And uh, in this episode, it's uh, something we haven't done before. We have reached out to all of the critics who have written critics lists for our Best in Beer issue. Um, so we've got uh, Kate Bernat, we've got Samer Kadari, we've got Stan Hieronymus, we've got Alex Kidd, and we have got Joe himself. Uh, I am not going to go through my critics list, and so if you want to read it, you're going to have to buy the magazine or subscribe. Of course, you already subscribe, so uh, you know you don't need to go out to do that, right? Of course, you do. Right. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to go through those, and uh, we've uh, we've got each of them on the line. They're going to uh, each talk with us here about uh, you know some of their uh, thoughts and feelings behind some of their choices and some of their bests of the year. Before we do that, nearly two thousand breweries across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico partner with GND Chillers. Innovative modular designs and no proprietary parts propel GND ahead as the premier choice for your glycol chilling needs. Breweries you recognize like Russian River and Kasi, Jack Sabby, Samuel Adams, and a bunch more that you've heard on this very podcast. All trust GND to chill the beer you love. Call GND Chillers to discuss your project today or reach out directly at gdchillers.com. Also, haze for days in your IPAs. Carry Biohaze from BSG adds that perfect, stable, cloudy appearance for your hazy recipe. Made with all natural ingredients, Biohaze is a free flowing microgranular powder that binds with protein molecules in beer that form polyphenol protein complexes to produce a cloudy haze. This unique product can be added to final beer to give your beer that famous haze. Find out more about Biohaze at bsgcraftbrewing.com or contact them at 1 800 374 2739. First up on our list of guest critics is uh, Kate Bernat. Thanks for joining us here on the podcast, Kate. I am excited to know that this year is coming to an end. I think we all are. It's now that the weather is turning colder. It, it, it's the, it's an exciting thing because that means we're closer to next year. And if we're closer, like normally I don't love the onset of winter, but this year in particular, I'm really, really excited about it because we get every step, we get closer to next year, which hopefully means traveling real life and all of those things again. Fingers um, crossed. Nonetheless, this year you were still able to uh, get out there, try some beers, or at least stay in there and have some <laughs> beers uh, uh, sent to you to try. Um, a little bit of travel before everything shut down, of course. Talk, let's talk about your top 10 beers of the year. What's the first on your list? So first on my list uh, is from a perennial favorite brewery, Jack's Abbey, and it was their shipping out of Boston Amber Lager. Um, I shouldn't be surprised when Jack's Abbey does a really, really good job <laughs> at lagers. I'm, I'm not surprised, but this beer was just so cozy and delicious. Um, really nice, like pumpernickel flavor. Uh, I didn't write this, but I thought about it. Uh, I don't know if there are any other fans of the bread at the Outback Steakhouse. <laughs> I, the brown bread at Outback okay. is okay. delicious. It's kind of sweet like pumpernickel e okay. i don't know as a kid i was obsessed with the bread at outback and this beer reminded me of that uh i hope i don't offend the brewers at jack's abbey but. i i don't see how they could be offended um <laughs> this we you know as we were developing our editors list uh you know had to make a tough decision between all of the beers that they have uh, that we've tried that have been so good from their Oktoberfest beer uh, to post shift pills. Um, ultimately, it was the Springdale Kolsch uh, from their ale brand that made the top 20 beers of the year, uh, best beers, editor's picks in 2020 from Craft Beer and Brewing. Uh, and in fact, I noticed that you have three breweries on your personal list that are also in uh, our editor's picks for top 20 beers. I'm not saying that there's a correlation. I'm just saying you know how to pick them. Uh, um. <laughs> great minds, telepathy. Um, I really, I mean, I know you guys s 
sweat the overall list. I sweat this list so hard every year. Like I really think hard about it. So it's very gratifying when we overlap because I know I'm not crazy. And there's, there's actually a lot of significant overlap between all of these. Let's talk about number two on your list. Yeah. So, um, it is the only IPA on my list, which is kind of wild. Um, I realized kind of after I assembled this, I was like one IPA. Oh my God. They're going to revoke my press credentials. Um, but it's the bubble wrap IPA from Crux out of Bend, Oregon. Um, just something about the alchemy in this beer was so memorable for me out of all the IPAs we've had this year. It's a hazy IPA, just these like really interesting everyone's after the tropical flavors, but the tropical flavors in this were so interesting to me, like kiwi and honeydew and strawberry. And there was all this really nice oat and wheat in the grist, but then, um, it just cleaned up really clean at the end with really nice carbonation. Um, and it was just everything I kind of want in a hazy IPA in one little package. And I thought it was great. Fantastic. I got to visit Crux for the first time um, back in February of this year. And it's such a beautiful brewery. I, I ordered a red ale just because I wanted to try something out of the ordinary. And it was a nice hoppy red ale. It was absolutely stunningly delicious and just hit the spot. Um, yeah. uh, and I loved choosing. I love that even unexpected beers that um, you don't know that you're going to like, you know, from a brewery like Crux are just going to nail it every time. What's uh, what's number three on your list? Number three. And these are in no particular order. But, uh, great. The next one on your list. The next one on my list is from the before time when we could travel, <laughs> uh, which seems like a million miles away, but was in fact this year apparently um the last time i was in chicago uh i went and had pizza and beer at peace one of my favorite places in the whole city the awesome brewer jonathan cutler has left since then but the beer that i put on this list that i can't stop thinking about um is his uh swinging single belgian single and it was just really a style i don't see enough of or a lot of and it was so flavorful but like still kind of demure and didn't um didn't overwhelm the you know i'm eating it with pizza and it's like a brew pub so you're with your friends and none of it like knocked you over the head in a way that is distracting but was just the more i kept sipping it the more i was like there's not one thing wrong with this beer um and I ordered a bunch more of them, which is uh, saying something when there's so many other great beers on their list. So, um, yeah, I was just really excited about a Belgian single that was so memorable. Fantastic. Um, what's up next? Uh, we will continue our tour of Europe by way of the United States with Wayfinders um, CZAF. Is that do I use the acronym? Oh, that's Czech as fuck. Check as as heck <laughs> for the no everyone's over twenty one. Yeah, everyone's over twenty one listening um, to this podcast. It is marked that's explicit so nice. on the yeah yeah. Ooh, <laughs> I've gotten in trouble for cursing on the radio before. So um, <laughs> we try to make sure that they're well pointed, but in this case, we're going to accurately describe the name of the beer, and so so there it is. Exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, again, also not surprised. Wayfinder makes a really great um check lager the like really brioche flavors some really um assertive hot bitterness that that kind of brings it all together and what i love about this beer is that you can pay so much attention to it if you're a beer nerd and you're you know picking apart every little detail but you could just as easily after you've had that first one like kind of forget about it and just have three more and enjoy them without it being some kind of intellectual experiment we love Wayfinder, and of course, Relapse made our, our top twenty uh, beers this year. Um, and their uh, some of the uh, rest of their beers have scored highly for our blind panel through the rest of the year. Um, a fantastic brewery, and just making really cool cool beers across the uh, across the board there, and doing it with a killer style. I mean, you gotta. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that packaging and the label game is just on point. On point. Mm-hmm. Um, for the next one, uh, you head to Oklahoma. Oklahoma and another excellently named beer called Rodeo Spritz from Heirloom Rustic Ale is a brewery I really like out of Tulsa. 3.2% rice lager. I was drinking this in the summer in my backyard. Um, Could not think of anything more 
refreshing. Um, I love rice lagers. I wish more breweries dabbled in them, actually. Um, it had actual body in it for such a light beer, which I found really um, a, a feat of uh, brewing. And I would drink every ounce of this if it were available consistently near me. So, <laughs> uh, And you stay in that kind of center of the country for your next beer. Yes. Uh, I'm going to pretend that Half Acre read what I wrote in Critics List last year, which is that I wanted more dry stouts. And then <laughs> I found Original Reaper and my prayers were answered. Um, this was a beer that a lot of Chicago friends were telling me about, and I finally got to try it. And they were all right. No, no adjuncts, no lactose, no distractions, roast, little almond shells, kind of like molasses flavor in there. And just... Uh, perfect beautiful all i all i wanted in a stout ever what's next on your list uh wyoming just north of where i am here in colorado actually between us since you're in montana and i'm in colorado this is the the state uh the middle ground <laughs> this is where we could meet up uh, geographically uh meet you for a beer in sheridan wyoming um so black tooth brewings uh 1314 is the name of the beer um this was the 2019 edition of their barrel age English strong ale, which they brew every year as kind of an anniversary beer. I just loved, uh, this year's edition. It was in some barrels from Wyoming whiskey. Um, and I loved that they went with like an English strong ale for this instead of a stout, like a lot of other people are doing. Um, I just thought there were some really nice fruit flavors in here that didn't turn saccharin, but were like those plum and fig. And I think, um, those work so, so well with like the vanilla from the barrel, um, a little bit of like sherry character at the end and alcohol to, you know, kind of warm you up there. And I, I just really love this beer and it's so decadent and like desserty without being pastry if that makes sense um i'm sounding really like a pastry hater no, right now no, but, no. Uh... <laughs> um, and, and i you know even if i do uh, uh make some jokes that direction i drink quite a few of them and uh and i can enjoy well-made beers um you get very light with your next beer yes uh a kolsch from dovetail brewing i mean you could put almost any of their beers on this list, right. I think. But the Kolsch stood out to me because, again, on that Chicago trip when I was visiting in the before times, um, they were having, Dovetail was hosting their Kolsch night, which I want to believe, again, was um, solely because I was in town. Uh, but they turned the upstairs of their brewery into like a proper um, a proper beer hall from Cologne and they had the, the proper Kolsch service and they had blood sausage. And I just thought they nailed the whole experience i have not um i've not been to Cologne. i don't i cannot compare it to the real thing but it was as close as i've ever gotten so uh thank you dovetail for letting me experience that uh stateside i guess um and yeah and the beer is fantastic needless to say yeah having a, an experience like that attached to it uh makes everything uh more uh salient in your memory uh next up you uh you go to the east coast yes um Another perennial favorite brewery, Allagash, um, came up with a beer this year called Two Lights, which I don't really know how to describe as a beer style. It's kind of a beer wine um, crossover. So it has Sauvignon Blanc must, which is part of the grape, and then lager and champagne yeast, um, plus some really nice Amarillo, Simcoe, Nelson Sauvin. Just quenching, beautiful, like you again you could pick it apart and notice all these really elegant wine characteristics of this beer or it could just be this really refreshing backyard summer quenching beer and i just thought it was so lovely and not it was it was packaged in cans which i loved it wasn't in some fancy corking cage uh which they could have just as easily done but i i liked the accessibility of this style of beer absolutely with you 100 percent. the last time i had that was uh we had some kegs of it at our brewers retreat up at uh, uh but uh in maine uh out on the coast that uh that jason had uh, recommended that uh, we tap for that and you know um so we were drinking quite a bit of it and what a beautiful beer to drink on the coast of maine uh right there with some lighthouses in view uh last on your list is a, a local nod so that they don't take away your montana uh, beer writer card 
Yes. And because I, I love to promote the amazing beer that's being brewed here in Montana. And there are a this lot beer... of fantastic breweries in Montana. I mean, and yes. per capita, Montana, actually, uh, Montana and Vermont are the two highest, uh, lar- uh, biggest states for breweries per capita anywhere in the United States. There's something like 80 plus breweries in Montana with a tiny little population and a huge yeah. geography. So, uh, yeah, no, kudos to Montana for um, for making some great beer. Yeah, this, uh, this beer is from Map Brewing uh, in Bozeman. It has previously won a GABF medal. Um, I just got to try it for the first time this past year. Uh, an, it's an oatmeal stout, 80 chain oatmeal stout. Um, just another, like, Again, I if I tried to find fault with it, I I couldn't. Um, it was just so perfectly made, and um, I love that it's a beer that this brewery has made since their inception and hasn't. Apparently, the brewers tell me they haven't changed it much. It's just like, well, we have a hit, and we're we're not deviating. Um, another fun thing about Montana beer is that so little of it travels outside of our state. So, um that's my plug to when it is safe to do so visit Montana and drink our delicious beers. Absolutely. So in in terms of the questions that we posed to critics this year, uh, the first one today's drinkers should pay attention to draft lines. (laughs) You don't notice them till you notice them and then it's bad. (laughs) Um, I think it's hard to explain to, to drinkers like why draft lines are important, why draft quality should matter. Um, You know it, again, when it's wrong. Um, But I think we should, as drinkers, advocate for bars that do a great job and, you know, be appreciative that they tell us when they clean their lines and that they pay a lot of attention to that. Um, And it will just encourage more bars to pay attention to it, which, um, yeah, when we get back to drinking in bars, I want all those lines squeaky clean. On the flip side, brewers themselves have to remain vigilant and careful that the places that they are selling to um, are also maintaining those kinds of standards. Next question today's brewers should pay attention to. I summed this up with the word integrity, um, and I'm not going to go on too long of a spiel about all the things that happened in our country this year, um, whether they're social issues, whether it's the pandemic. um, But uh, I think coming out of the Black Lives Matter protests, um, it became really clear that drinkers want to know what breweries stand for. And it, it doesn't necessarily have to be on the topic of social issues, but in general, like, what is your brewery about? What are your values? And how, more importantly, how do you live them? How do you enact them in your business? Um, And I I think that's a valid question to ask of businesses where we spend our money and who say they're about community and about giving back. Um, So I just think, you know, that's something breweries need to be able to answer. What are your values and how do you live them? 100%. A promising thing that's come out of this year of COVID-19. Uh, buying alcohol on the internet, <laughs> something we've all wanted to do, right? right. Uh, for a while, we can buy seemingly anything else under the sun on the internet. I can buy live chicks de- to be delivered to my door on the internet, but I couldn't buy beer. Um, I think a lot of that is changing now um, in light of COVID, either because of legal changes or because of just expanded e-commerce platforms for breweries, um, breweries using them much more. And that is very encouraging. I hope it sticks around. For sure. For sure. Well, Kate, thanks for joining us uh, for the best in beer, uh, your best in beer critics list. We're going to jump next to uh, uh, Samer Kadari, who you actually recommended to us this year as a critic, as we were trying to find someone who could sum up uh, New England for us. And so we're going to jump in and uh, Samer is going to share his list with us next. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Before we do that, Five Star Chemicals and Supply is your leading provider of cleaning, sanitizing, and adjunct chemicals for breweries throughout North America and internationally. All products have been formulated with safety, equipment, material, and quality in mind. Interested in trying their products? Contact support at fivestarchemicals.com to inquire about a free craft brew sample pack and only pay the shipping. Just mention that you heard it here on the podcast. Cheers to beer. Also, Grandstand is your source for the latest trends in custom printed drinkware, apparel, and promotional items. They make your job easy by serving as your one-stop shop for everything. 
Visit egrandstand.com forward slash lookbook to see what's trending. Sommer, this is your first year writing a critics list for craft beer and brewing, um, but uh, you, we were looking for someone who could give us some nuanced uh, on the ground uh, opinions and thoughts from the New England area. Why don't you get us started? What's, uh, what's uh, the first beer on your list? And these are not in a hierarchical order. These are <laughs> unranked, uh, all of your top 10. Oh, thanks for having me, Jamie. Um, I put down Allagash River Trip. It was actually a beer that I hadn't had until a few months ago, which was actually kind of funny to me because I really like a lot of the beers in the Allagash portfolio. I do take trips up to the tasting room when it was open, um, but I've never actually had River Trip. And when I first did, um, I was actually really impressed about kind of the delicacy of how it was as a, a Belgian style beer. And my instant thought was that it was very approachable and that if I were to kind of share this beer with someone who had no idea of that style, that that would be the beer that I would select. I think that's really cool. And I love that uh, you can highlight a beer that is focused on that kind of nuance and has that kind of confidence without having to overdo it. What's uh, what's number two on your list? Night Shift Brewing Sombra. Um, this beer, I've like actually experienced the the greater Boston area group of, um, you know, the industry breweries uh, have their own kickball league. We all kind of get together. A lot of the night shift people are close to me. And this beer kind of gets, you know, thrown around between lager lovers. And as it got colder and as it got darker, I always am a fan of like a bready, biscuity beer. And this one hit the spot. It was essentially like a Modella Negro that was delicious and I couldn't get enough of. So That's awesome. What's uh, what's number three on your list? Oxbow Brewing's Lupolo. So the team up in Newcastle, um, you know, generally makes farmhouse style saisons and other uh, mixed firm beers, but their their clean beer program is also really good. Lupolo is an incredible Italian style Pilsner. I think a lot of people kind of associate almost Oxbow with that flagship, even though I don't know if it's considered one of their flagships. I had it recently um, from a Lucre faucet, Czech pour style, and it just hit all the notes. I mean, if you want uh, a crisp lager with a little subtle hop finish, this one's a perfect one. We won't get into uh, any of the American critiques of the term Italian style uh, Pilsner. Um, and anyone who wants to really debate that, uh, I'm happy to, to jump into that debate with you. <laughs> um, number four on your list. Bissell Brothers and Vitamin C. Um, tray Flip. So that was a um, cream ale, imperial cream ale, actually. So this was actually one of those beers that I wanted to select because of kind of the playful playfulness of what is happening in the craft beer scene, whether it's a collaboration, whether it's these young breweries, whether it's a style that they're kind of turning on its head. But this one actually was very good. Um, I was actually very impressed. And I haven't had a cream ale that was an imperial cream ale. Um, the what Carton, uh, Carton is the only um, uh, uh, imperial cream ale that immediately comes to mind in that kind of thing. But yeah, and I would I would even consider Carton within the school of um, you know these these new breweries that right, are right. kind of changing up the scene and causing you know the the haze train and the hype, sure, which sure. I wanted to pay a bit of homage to. Yeah, um, wh what is it about this particular beer that, uh, from a flavor perspective, that's so fun? Um, I thought that it almost leaned into, you know, this, this haze, hazy beer, and especially in its, um, in its appearance and in its, uh, aroma. Oh, did but, they make a hazy cream ale? Did they do that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, the, you oh. know, the, the, the flavor profile was more, was more uh, aligned to, to, <laughs> to the cream ale style so that fair was enough it. fair enough no if noah of course has been on the podcast dino from vitamin c has also been on the podcast and uh, uh we appreciate the kind of creative spirit that's driving both of them um what's next up on your list 
Um, I have uh, Dovetail Brewing's Vienna Lager. I, I don't know if they call it a Vienna style lager or a Vienna Lager. Again, going back to abbreviating or we'll call it Vienna it. style because it's made in America and uh, not made in Vienna. But uh, but yes, uh, Dovetail. You know, you're not the only critic to have Dovetail on their list this year. In fact, uh, I think Dovetail made at least three different uh, critics lists, maybe four. And one of our uh, top 20 beers of 2020, of course, with uh, Dovetail Hellas. And so you were right on the money with this pick, my friend. And and rightfully so. I mean, you know, I will admit that I am a, a lover of lager and I can't, like I said before, I love those kind of multi biscuity profiles. This is especially clean. It's one of those beers that you want to continue to drink, especially within good company and um, I was lucky to have this beer, um, in Chicago. And then I also had a couple cans sent to me from some good friends. So it, it made me reminiscent of kind of like a, a festive beer. And I love that lager trading is a thing now. I mean, 2020, <laughs> who would have thought that people are who shipping cans of Vienna lager around the country? Um, you know, but we're seeing it with, you know, Bierstadt and Ennegrin and Notch and Dovetail. And my God, what a beautiful uh, time it is to be alive for beer drinkers. Um, what's next on your list? Um, I have Trillium Brewing's uh, Wonderful Complex Individual. So that was actually a collaboration with... Um, Dr. J, as well as the Urban Farming Institute. Again, I was lucky to have this beer on draft. Um, I didn't get to see Dr. J when she came um, to present about it, but it was on a, it was in February, um, and it was particularly cold in New England. This beer on draft was really, uh, at first sip, I was actually expecting something a lot more um, hot in terms of alcohol. But it drank uh, really well, and it had notes of cinnamon, nutmeg, even pecan. But I don't think it, it it's nut free. Um, and you know, I was lucky to bring some cans back, and when I just I really appreciated the the collaboration's attention with this beer as well as the beer itself. It's an absolutely beautiful thing when the social goals of a collaboration align with the quality of the beer that they've produced and, you know, both of those things reinforce each other. What's next on your list? Hill Farmstead's Nordic Saison. So um, I actually still have never been as a New England person to, uh, you know, the to Hill Farmstead. You've never, up and for, I've so never I've been, been to Hill Farmstead. I know. I've never, I've never been to <laughs> Hill Farmstead and I've okay. had um, Hill Farmstead in so many different places yeah. but never at the site but for some reason something about drinking that beer is that like you can trace it to the land i don't know I, there's something about what sean and his team do, do that makes it really special um and this saison i'm actually not even a huge fan of saisons as, as a style but it it has that kind of grassy honey it's i i I was a huge fan and and even because of the the bottle format it's a nice beer to share with people which i think is always a fun thing to do i love those ten dollar a bottle hill farmstead uh farmhouse farmstead ale since they uh they have their trademarked term for it it is such a beautiful thing that something as simple as Nordic Saison or Arthur or Anna or Florence or, you know, these just very simple beers that they sell at a very incredibly reasonable price um, can make for such a fulfilling experience. And so no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> if what, aliens were to come to Earth, I would offer them a Hill Farmstead beer. <laughs> they'd never want to leave. And they would never... <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Summer. <laughs> <laughs> what's uh what's next on your list um i have halfway crooks uh farina which is um again one of these kolsch style beers um they call it a top fermenting lager which is funny um the team at uh halfway crooks their whole branding is a bit uh playful um i really like what they're doing um 
again, I'm a lover of lager, so... Well, you're not the only one with halfway crooks on their list. Uh, uh, Stan Hieronymus also had halfway crooks on his list. Um, But we'll hear about that next. Um, What's your uh, uh, number nine beer on the list? The Southern Heights. um, It's probably awesome. And their version was the round 10 that I really liked. Um, I, I, again, admit I've never been to this brewery before, but I've heard in Austin that it's it's the, the Brewers Brewery. Um, I think it's a smaller brewery out of East Austin. I got this beer from a friend um, and it was one of those beers that, you know, you consume it and it's over and you wish you don't know what happened. You're like, how is that beer so good? And it was really reminiscent for me of um, an IPA that was that existed about like, you know, 10 years ago that just like hit some nostalgic factor that it wasn't overly hoppy overly bitter it just had all the right notes that i i missed (laughs) your your last beer the the final beer of your top 10 treehouse on the fly there was a time during the pandemic uh i know it's still going on but i've slowed down my visits to treehouse but there was a time where i was going almost weekly um and there contactless pickup service was really incredible um this beer was um an homage or named after um that contactless pickup service called on the fly uh treehouse knocks it out of the park when it comes to these double ipas um and i just really took full advantage of getting this beer when it was available as well as their other offerings um you can't go wrong. <laughs> sure, sure. And it's easy, you know, it's easy to want to knock them down because they're so successful. And as far as craft breweries go, there's such a unique story brewing 50,000 plus barrels of beer and selling every single ounce of it out of their own location um, is an incredible anomaly in the world of craft beer. There's no one else that's doing that at the, you know, uh, at the kind of level that they are. And so naturally speaking, you know, you look for the holes in the armor and you want to find, you know, as a critic, find some way to, you know, you know, uh, um, find the things that they're doing wrong. And yet there's, you know, I think you could argue that they're making the best beer that they've ever made, that they are using their scale and using the, um, you know, the profit that they are developing to improve what they're doing and get better at what they're doing all of the time. And, uh, you know, and so it's cool to see a brewery at that kind of scale still so inwardly focused on improving their own processes and improving the quality of what they do so that they can be happier about what they're releasing. I completely agree. I mean, their operation is, is down to a T their beers, like their QC is amazing. And, you know, their fan base is larger than ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about some of the more conditional questions in your, your critics list. Um, what should today's drinkers pay attention to? Open dialogue. Um, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, now that we are spending more time not face to face, we can kind of hide behind screens. There's a lot of communication going on. Uh, in the beer world, um, whether it's marketing or just discourse um, and holding each other accountable, uh, I just wish that people, you know, recognize that these are also people behind the screens as well. And you're saying that as someone who has some experience doing social media marketing for breweries in the past um, yes. and a little bit of understanding and empathy goes a long way. What should today's brewers pay attention to? Sabro hops. Um, Sabro is a hop that I've been seeing uh, quite a bit lately. I'm sure brewers that are listening already are aware of it. I'm sure avid drinkers are already aware of it. But one of the things that I wanted brewers to pay attention to is that it is actually becoming somewhat of a uh, divisive hop. Um, it's almost like the the cilantro of hops, if you will. Um, some people there may are drinkers get the... that are definitely not loving Sabro, huh? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't mind it, um, but I I can 
you know, that there's this coconutty taste that throws people sometimes. So. For sure. For sure. You know, and it, it's like Nelson Sauvin and, and some of the others, those can all be polarizing in certain kinds of ways. What, what's a promising thing that's come from this era of COVID-19? With, you know, aluminum shortages and just the general kind of grief of what's going on, I've seen a lot of people come together. Um, I've heard like, you know, especially in the beginning of these things where things were a lot more uncertain, just larger breweries reaching out to um, their smaller breweries that kind of um, to see if they needed any assistance, that kind of competition seemed to um, cease a bit, which was really nice. Um, and that just, you know, we all banded together, um, again, even if we're not able to visit each other or go to these tap rooms, we're kind of supporting each other in other ways. Well, Samer, thanks for joining us uh, and sharing yeah. your critics list this year. Uh, we're Thank going you, to, um, we're going to pivot next and, uh, talk to Stan Hieronymus. But before we do that, ABS Commercial is excited to be a part of today's podcast. ABS is a full brewery outfitter offering brew houses, tanks, keg washers, and small parts. ABS wanted to do something fun for the craft beer industry, so they're giving away an ABS Keg Viking keg washer live on December 5th, which also happens to be National Repeal Day. To enter, go to www.abs-commercial.com. Click on the Keg Viking page and fill out the contest form for your chance to win. Also, the quickest way to see every new issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is by subscribing, as subscribers get immediate access to digital editions of the magazine via PDF and mobile apps. If you want to read the entire Best in Beer issue now, go to beerandbrewing.com and click on the subscribe button to join. Next up, we're going to Atlanta, Georgia, where... Uh, Veteran beer writer and uh, hops aficionado Stan Hieronymus is going to share his critics list with us. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Stan. Um, you had some real highlights in 2020, despite this kind of challenging year of experiencing beer. Sure. Uh, and I visited some old friends, too, uh, that reminded me the, the beers in some cases, uh, in fact, in several cases, the, the old friends are places I, I couldn't drink them regularly. But I think, oh, if we lived in St. Louis, this would be a, a great beer to be in lockdown with. Let's, uh, let's talk about some of your top 10 beers of the year. Why don't you uh, start us off uh, with the first one on your list? Well, I, I've, I have an Urban Chestnut uh, Schnickel Fritz, which, as I said, is, was a perfect summer beer. It's a great ballpark beer. You know, yeah. it's just refreshing. And I, I would like to, and I, I don't mean to belittle the brewers here in Atlanta, but for one thing, brewers across the country will tell you, it's hard to sell uh, uh, Hefeweizen. And so a lot of them do not mess with them. And Schnickel Fritz is probably the best Hefeweizen in the country. I drank it in February, and that's because that's when we were in St. Louis. And I thought, oh yeah, I want to be drinking this the rest of the year. But then the rest of the year came up. Um, talk to me about that number two on your list. Speaking of old friends. Yeah, our Russian River Temptation, which has been around 20 years. Um, and, and by chance, we were in uh, California beginning of February, again, before times. Um, but it turns out Russian River, as uh, Vinny Russo decided to, to change the process, uh, the way that he makes Temptation. Um, and he has a cool ship, so what the heck. And, and by yeah. chance, when I was there, they were actually running a batch of uh, temptation into the cool ship and basically what they do with the process for that is they're going to take one third of the beer right after it's brewed and that runs through the cool ship two thirds just go per usual get pitched with the yeast and uh, into stainless steel and then after a day they come together and they go into the barrels um, it's still a great beer I, it, I it, from memory I couldn't tell you what the difference is. They're both wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, for number three, it's uh, closer to home to you there in Atlanta. Yeah, the, the uh, Orpheus Everything Lasts Forever. And this, it, it turns out, which I had no idea when I moved here, that, that Orpheus is doing spontaneous beers, and, and they've been doing for four years now. So this was a blend of, of barrels from all four years. Um, they are... Um, it, 
in a great location right by Piedmont Park uh, in Atlanta, although they're actually in the, the basement of what I think is an apartment building or a business. So it's it's just a plain old basement. Yeah. And, and their cool ship does not look like a cool ship. It's two tanks that they barely fill up. Uh, the tour guides like to tell you that they're getting some bugs from the park and maybe the botanical <laughs> gardens nearby. But mostly, you know, they, they do open the garage doors and, and things like that. Wherever those bugs are coming from, they are tasty. I've had some good beer from Orpheus this year. They are definitely on the uh, upward swing. Um, number four on your list is also from Atlanta. Yeah, and, and that's Halfway Crooks People Power. Um, Halfway Crooks uh, makes lagers the way I like to have them made. It's that simple. There's... I'll, I'll taste this beer and I'll taste this with other <clears throat> brewers from Atlanta. They're going, how come you like this one so much? And I'm going, well, what don't you like about it? And they'll say, you know, to me, it has too much sulfur. And I'll go, right. Uh, <laughs> it has the right amount of sulfur for me. Um, uh, this particular one seemed to bring everything together. It happens to be a Pilsner. And of course, the People Power, that's that's Three's uh, fundraiser for the ACLU. Um, it's It's... So it has that nice lager character, and, and then the hops are uh, shipped directly from a farm in Germany, um, the Seitz Farm, which also ships their hops to Urban Chestnut, uh, Casey Beer, Jack's Abbey, I think Bierstadt may use them. Hmm. Um, so they've got a pretty good pedigree. Um, yeah. And even though Halfway Crooks is tiny, so they, they took a pallet and then they split it among the other brewers in Atlanta and as you know I, I, it makes it easier to form an attachment with these beers when you know stories like that also helps right. that they're great hops for sure for sure um, number five on your list is uh, from the brewery that I'm drinking a pint of right now uh, what, which what are you drinking some dovetail Pilsner oh that's Pilsner is very nice um, uh, this is a Rauch beer um, which I, I is entirely different than Grojiski, the beer I have promised the last two years to continue to put on my list. You've done and, a valiant job uh, and, pushing it, and, uh, and Live Oak but, and others have been able to kind of keep the flame alive for you. Um, but I, I I didn't have Live Oak Grojiski this year, and this is a, where I stop and cry a little bit. Um, and it's an entirely different beer. That's you know, it's that's light on the palate, like uh, less than three and a half percent. Really hoppy for a beer with that light of palate. Um, th this beer is just chocolate and bacon, and you know, it it works for me. That sounds that's, delicious. The next beer was was probably the biggest surprise, and that was a, that that was a burial from North Carolina. Um, their fest beer. And it, it's a, a, a kind of, a, I would call it more of a hybrid uh, between what, what we keep thinking in, in the U.S. Our fest beers are basically a Meritzen. Right. And this this is lighter in color, a little lighter on the palate. Um, and and the first time they did this, uh, I believe it was a collaboration with Creature Comforts in Athens. Uh, but now uh, they're they're getting a, uh, their malt from Germany for whatever reason it lightens up and we had a lot of Oktoberfest this year I'm not quite sure why it happened to be sort of where we were and all of a sudden people had Oktoberfest it seemed like more or it may be because when we're in St. Louis I just drink urban chestnuts um, but maybe it was the accumulation of too much Munich and Vienna malt and some of these other ones and this one hit it and go got a little hop character got great malt character but not that sweet whatever but still nice and toasty um uh, yeah. up next on your Rich. list you uh take a turn towards uh, mixed fermentation that's right and uh greenville south carolina which is only uh like i forget if it's maybe it's three and a half hours or two and a half hours it's not very far uh, people who are, should understand it if if you are headed to Asheville because everybody heads to Asheville it's only about an hour south of Asheville and I would say that'll just birds fly south alone and there there are like 72 other breweries in Greenville I swear yeah. um, and uh, it, it, 
but again, that's a brewery that sort of hits my palate. Uh, just like I talk about what Russian River does. They, they make a, uh, a hoppy beer. I like the hoppy beer. They make a mixed beer. I like a mixed beer. Uh, Birds Fly South, um, in fact, has two different uh, breweries within their brewery. They're still a tiny little place, not going to make 3,000 barrels. But they have a clean side and a farmhouse side. Um, I tend to drink what's on the farmhouse side. Um, the inspiration was this. Um, when uh, Sean Johnson, brewer founder at Birds Fly South, tasted the beers at St. Somewhere and said to Bob Sylvester, you need to teach me how to do this. And Bob sort of laughed and went away. And he just kept calling him up. And he said, I'll be in the morning with coffee. How do you like your coffee? Um, and th that inspired Birds Fly South. This beer is a collaboration between the two. Um, it is, and, and flavor-wise, it's right, and it has peaches in it. Mixed fermentation <laughs> peaches, like yeah. y you've won me over that way. Um, go wrong. And and a segue, actually, I, I think it might have been two years ago. I had a Lost Abbey Veritas beer. That was the one with peaches, and and this reminded me somewhat of that. I'm going once again. I am a sucker for peaches. Yeah. But in this case, it's a Lost Abbey. It's actually called Tiny Bubbles, and they have that as a separate brand. Um, but, uh, and, and it gives them uh, a quick sour, uh, which they had already planned on doing before we all went to everything in cans. This uh, one's such a creative beer, this Tiny Bubbles, because it's quick sour, but it also kind of plays in that spritzy, seltzery kind of territory where it's light and it's dry and it's bright and it's heavily effervescent. It's not heavily fruited, and so it's very light on the palate. Uh, and it's a really fun beer to drink. And it also has a nice history because it's, it's the name, um, actually, it's a beer that Eric Rose made, and he meddled at GABF in 2010 when nobody knew what a Goza was. Yeah. Um, and and then uh, the, the, the final beer that's a beer, I've got one more here, but it's, you know, that uh, we'll get to it, uh, is Well Spent Buck. Uh, buck means buckwheat. And, and Well Spent's a brewery which has been featured in one of the, maybe the industry guide. Uh, craft we did a brewing case study on guide. them. And, the, yeah. Right. And and it it's a brewery that came back from death. I mean, they closed. Looked like they were not going to reopen. Um, and I, I'd been there once. And they opened in St. Louis. They were supposed to open before we moved away. They hadn't. So we came back one time, I went there, I had the beer, really nice beers, particularly low gravity beers. You know, you have a mild that's really a mild, like three and a half percent. And they managed to get open uh, in February, just a, like a week before we were back there. So I had a chance to go there and drink the beers and and have Buck, which I, is has a combination of, um, of buck is the primary one alternative grains right. um and then it is a uh, hop with sriracha ace which is sriracha ace for me is like nelson sauvin it's either great or it's horrible there is no middle ground when somebody yeah. says it has sriracha ace i know i'm never going to drink that again or i'm going to be in love with it that that one just strikes me as really nice low alcohol beer and so the final one i put in was the all together ipa um, did not have that many of them in Georgia, to be honest, um, but they were all good. Creature Comfort is really good. Um, if, it, and it's important to remember, we're talking about a fiscal year here. Right. You know, you know we were done in, in mid-September. <clears throat> we, we, uh, we roughly think about our fiscal year for beer of the year as GABF to GABF, because mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, kind of puts what, what is what is this GABF you speak it, of? You know, back when we used to have beer events, it, it was a pretty yeah. big deal. Yeah. You know? um, and I, uh, otherwise, quite frankly, I I might have gone with Black is Beautiful. Um, there are more of those in Georgia. Yeah. And again, haven't had a dud yet and had some that are really, really good. I am particularly looking forward to Orpheus's. Uh, that hasn't been released yet. Well, both All Together and Black is Beautiful were co-beers okay, of the yeah. year and our editors picked oh, yeah, for so top 20 beers. Yeah, and so uh, know. both, I think, are tremendous projects that are oh, yeah. well-deserving. And it's been such a testament to the entire 
world of craft beer that uh, 800 some odd and 1100 some odd breweries have all joined in on those projects collaboratively and have done really creative work in it but i've talked enough about that let's talk about some questions that we posed to you uh, today's drinkers should pay attention to i said the beer the fourth time you drink it um for those of you who drink two ounces and enter it on untapped there are two reasons to do this you have it you might discover that you don't like it that's a bad thing you might find things that you appreciate in the beer that you missed the previous times this idea sort of comes from garrett oliver it's like 15 years ago at a craft brewers conference he pointed out he said as brewers you need to go into places where your beer is being consumed and have four of them and if it's smoky that's where you need to be and see how your beer is tasting and that sort of thing uh, in this case I made it the drinkers and they're understanding it because of course you ask uh, what brewers should be paying attention to and to me that is the quality of their ingredients <clears throat> there's been a real focus on saying I want to have these these beers incredibly fresh particularly the hoppy beers and they're only thinking about that well if your hops are not good it doesn't make any difference if you're if they're fresh or not you need to make sure the quality of what you're getting and to go back when we talked about the sites farm hops which are obviously all german varieties a lot of people um, you know they're getting um, herzbrucker and middle and they're going i've never smelled these beer these hops I've never had hops that smell like these. Um, and, and then when you realize, and, and the same thing is certainly true of your, your grains, and, and we know what disasters can happen if you're not careful about your yeast. Uh, one promising thing that's come out of this year of COVID. Um, I'm just going to read what I wrote because it's, <laughs> I, because, because I got a combination of, of which side of the, the curb you're on. Uh, at least in some cases, the pandemic has caused both those on the brewery side of the curbside pickup and those on the consumer side to think more about their luck and privilege and to act accordingly. Um, and that means supporting your, your breweries. Uh, I, I've talked to so many brewers who are happy to see people on a regular basis and see them showing up and, and buying the beer and of course tipping well uh, all of those things and uh, there's a lot of discussion of privilege in craft beer right now there needs to be more for sure for sure well thanks uh, thanks for joining us Dan and thanks for sharing yeah. your critics list Thanks for letting me to continue to babble on about beer. Five years in a row, uh, you've uh, you're no longer the brown shoe. You're now the tuxedo, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm definitely not the tuxedo. Um, that I, I would be very uncomfortable. Well, next up, joining us remotely from Southern California to talk through his critics list for this 2020 best in beer issue episode everything else of craft beer and brewing is alex kidd the blogger behind don't drink beer welcome alex. jamie thank you for having me so this is your fifth year writing a critics list for craft beer and brewing you stan and i are uh, are the only critics who have written five years worth of critics <laughs> lists in this. so you're in special company there with stan the half decade crew <laughs> once i fit the full decade i get that satin baseball jacket with a 10 on it I yeah. like that. I like it a lot. I'm excited that you're going to talk us through your best in beer list, your top 10 beers of uh, 2020. So why don't we kick it off with uh, the number one beer on your list, Alex? All right. The thing that I loved more than anything else this year was a collaboration uh, from Southern Grist and Dissolver. Um, this is Wooden Teeth, and this is a barrel-aged barley wine that seemed to come out of nowhere and just was... It's a barley <laughs> wine, and it's your favorite? <laughs> I'm but shocked. that's not always the case. That's not always the case. That's a testament to how good this particular beer is. Um, in, in 2020, we saw a lot of barley wines that were leaning more almost towards the pastry realm, huge residual sugars, and this is just old school, like classic... Uh, Bit of honey, score bar, reason candy. It's it's awesome. 
one of those old school uh, kind of barley wine approaches made our best in beer list for 2020. And that was three rise men from Rubens. Uh, Same kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Same kind of thing. Like not, not uh, heaps of residual sweetness, not just this giant cloying mess uh, of a beer, but a thoughtful approach to malt and construction. So, um, you know, Southern Grist, I've been to the brewery uh, dissolver. You know, last time I was in Asheville, they weren't quite open yet, Mm -hmm. but uh, um, you know, interesting that uh, this kind of upstart uh, brand new brewery out of Asheville is uh, is making a thing. Huh? Totally. And I actually just uh, did some follow up work to see what else Dissolver is about. Solid Kolsch. They, it's it's weird. Like their their marketing and what they're doing is not the five tap handle California ale strain riff that used to cut it five years ago. Um, they, they're super innovative, and I'm curious to see what them and uh, Southern Grist are up to. Yeah, for sure. What's your number two on the list? Uh, number two on the and list. And these don't necessarily have to be in hierarchical uh, order by yeah, any stretch. Because I think a lot of these are, there's such different styles. It's like, I don't know how to even qualify that. But uh, the second one that I wanted to talk about was from Parish Brewing down in Louisiana, the double dry hopped Ghost in the Machine. Uh, not only was this the best hazy that I had uh, this year, uh, it actually won the hotly contested uh, hazy cup on my own show, uh, my podcast podcast small couture you know regular ghost of the machine was one of our beers of the year last year in craft mm-hmm. beer and brewing and so uh, i can't fault you on this pick whatsoever um beautiful beers and uh certainly proof that uh fantastic hazy ipa is unbounded by geography um how about uh the next beer on your list uh, the next beer that I really appreciated was the first barrel age offering out of phase three. Uh, this is Chicago area's golden boy, Sean Burns of, uh, Ram and then more. And now he's, you know, got his own place. So everybody was waiting for this thing. And this is just a Reese's peanut butter bomb. Um, but on one hand, you would expect that to just be kind of one dimensional, but I think that he's got such a handle on the casking that it like, it's not a lactose driven thing. It doesn't taste like coffee make creamer. It is first and foremost, an Imperial stout that has, you know, such an overwhelming peanut aspect. So it's, it's, it's hard to marry those two, but I think that they're doing a great job. I haven't tried that one yet, but, uh, it's certainly on my radar. What's, uh, what's the next beer on your list? Uh, the next beer is another collaboration. It's a merger of two places that I like independently. They're kind of birds of a feather in two different places. Um, out here in Southern California, we have Enigran, which is very similar in style, scope, and emphasis as the person they collaborated with, uh, Beerstadt Lagerhouse. They're both kind of bottom fermenting champions, and they both got together on this uh, this a pilsner to celebrate the Reinheitsgebot, which is like on paper this sounds like all right fine like it doesn't it's not very sexy in the modern beer world but it's like when you do something that is so crisp and clean and just like focused in in how it's executed like it takes something that good to to pull you away from all of these like acid malt barrel you know like all of those real showstoppers to just do something so clean I had to put it on the list. That's beautiful. We've had some great beers from Ennegrin. And of course, you know, Bierstadt has, has been a past beer of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, it was an awesome one in this uh, issue of the of the, uh, Best in Beer issue where we have the first ever lager that has appeared on our wish list beers. Whoa. Along with beers like Pliny the Younger and, you know, Dark Lord and, <laughs> you know, these kinds of, you know, hard to find uh, West Vletter in uh, 12. Um the first lager to ever appear on the wish list beers wow. was beer sot slow pour. And so <laughs> it's, it's a little heartwarming to see that kind of diversity creeping in here. Yeah. Um, no, but very, very cool. What's uh, what's next on your list. Uh, next up, I got to take it over to Maine. Uh, Bissell brothers who usually get uh, all kinds of praise for swish and substance and all of their hazy game. Um, I wanted to kind of key people's attention in to their Saison program. I think some of the hazy p- places, they secretly long to be farmhouse powerhouses. Like I know I know that Monkish is famous for their hazies, but they make top tier Saisons and Bissell, they do. Bissell Brothers is no, you know, no slouch in that regard. And this, the one thing I wanted to note about this was I opened this uh, at the very beginning of the year, back when you still could have, you know, people over. And there's something to be said about 
the accessibility of a beer. And this is kind of dovetails with what we were talking about with Ennegrin, but this is just so much lemon, lime, Sierra mist, uh, just just crisp, like, like that Brett profile that has like a lingering kind of brie rind to it. Uh, and really elegant marketing. So when you open one of those 750s, people are like, oh, this is this feels special. And the fact that people that drink orange wine or Jura or truly like all were clamoring, like, do you have another of those Bissell Brother bottles? Like it, that it was just one of those things where you go to have someone reach across the palate aisle and, you know, really touch someone in that realm kind of made me like, all right, I got to remember this. I love your Jura uh, wine references, uh, <laughs> you know, cause, cause I have some Jura bottles in, uh, in my cellar right now. Um, no, but I, I understand what you're saying about that kind of accessibility angle to it that, um, yeah, it is both sophisticated yet immediately apparent. And so people can feel like they're not intimidated by drinking it. It's not like they don't get it. You know, goose and lambic can be that way for a lot of people yeah. when they, they taste it. The flavors are challenging. My wife, when she drank, uh, you know, dry fontaine in the first times, like it tastes like burnt cat hair, you know, like, I mean, it becomes a very acquired taste. And so, um, both being accessible and uh, having some immediate hooks for people to understand those flavors, but also uh, having some depth to plumb for those that want to continue to explore what it is. It is definitely a beautiful thing. What's uh, what's next on your list? The next on my list seems like, oh uh, uh, yeah, of course it is. Like it's a subtle flex or some backhanded look at what I have, but that's, that is not the point. In fact, um, the, first of all, the beer is uh, the 2019 Cantillon Bleber, um, and I th I think I'm not alone in saying that Bleber is worth more in the bottle than it is actually being poured. Usually, um, the people who want to drink things on this level will just open a Saint Lambenus and call it a day because there's an argument to be made that Saint Lambenus is way more accessible, costs less, and is arguably better. But what I wanted to highlight this year was that. They, they mixed things up a little bit, and they added raspberry uh, to the bilberry lambic, and we opened it, and it just it, – it rounded it out. It became less of like the one-dimensional, acidic, like uh, blueberry affair, which notoriously a difficult fruit to capture the essence of. Um, the, the raspberry gave it this sort of one-two punch that, that just really made it enjoyable and less of like uh, a thing that you open up and get two ounces of. You know, like – you're usually content. You're like, that's, that's fine. It's Blaber. I've had it before. This was like, man, I wish I did not share it with my podcast co-host. <laughs> I want this thing to myself. Um, but, uh, this, this bottle actually too had a little bit of controversy behind it. Cause there was, uh, there was some, some labels that went out, uh, and apparently they used the old Yepe label, and it was they were saying that oh the 2019s are counterfeited and all all of this so um, actually we had Yepe on our show and got to the bottom of it it was not counterfeited it's just not when you're making like 300 bottles of Blaber it's not as serious as people think it is it's like in terms of TTB and getting those labels yeah. right use use some of those leftover labels no <laughs> yeah. sure I've I've had prior years I haven't had this year but uh, you've convinced me now I'm gonna have to go uh, uh, trade away my children's inheritance. <laughs> Uh, to go get a bottle <laughs> yes people actually open them now thank god uh what's ne <laughs> what's next on your list next up uh the multi-powerhouse revolution out of chicago they released um their follow-up to vsoj which is very uh special old jacket but this is vsor uh very special old ryeway and so this is essentially the same ultra casked two plus year component blended uh process that the previous deep wood series got but this one is is the base beer of ryeway instead of straight jacket and uh, you know i i think that this takes like all of like the showcase of what rye like huge rye beers are capable of with like that spice and um how well that it adheres to the cask profile um decidedly different from wooden teeth in the way that this is more of like an emphasis on the on pure casking itself because it toes that line of getting into that heat zone where some people can't handle it but it really just hits that nice like sazerac praline um plum like merging these weird flavor profiles and uh, it's it's awesome you know we i did a great episode on the podcast earlier with uh, marty and jim from revolution and marty goes into depth about 
their ultra high gravity extended aging program that kind of produces these kinds of flavors that they then blend into these mixes into this this kind of you know vso uh tier of beer and it's such a cool and creative process in order to achieve flavors that you get through blending that you don't get through a single stream kind of brewing process and uh so yeah i was super excited to see this on your list what's uh what's up next all right, we got to take it back to the classic West Coast IPA, which I am proud to say has seen a resurgence lately. Um, clear- We're all so excited about this. <laughs> Everyone beer. is excited. Yeah. Um, I-, I wanted to give a nod in your neighborhood in Colorado. Um, the whole project that um, Westbound and Down is doing, those cans have been awesome and deserve a nod because they're kind of in the same vein. Uh, but this is another collaboration that unites two West Coast powerhouses. Um, when you say Boneyard Brew, People already know that's Pacific Northwest, Sea Hops, you know, like got that clear aspect to it. And Altamont is kind of like Bay Area's analog to doing the same thing. And so united the two and it just feels like something straight out of like the mid to late 2000s in the best way. Like it's got that touch of pine and resin. Um, If you have difficulty drinking like multiple hazy IPAs, this is one of those beers that takes it back to when you can drink two to three, just, you know, IPAs or double IPAs, uh, kind of like an amped up blind pig in a way. Uh, and it just, it's, it's such a throwback and it's almost taken for granted. But, uh, when you get something that is remarkable in things that are overlooked, it has to be that much better to be remarkable. If that makes sense. What's the next on your list? Uh, next up on my list, we're taking it up to Alaska, and this is Anchorage Brewing Blessed. Uh, now, on paper, this seems like you know it's a pastry stout, and you figure, of course, Anchorage is going to do that like pretty well because they do pretty well with their stouts and barley wines. Um, the thing that really came out the gates was people were super shocked about the pricing on this. Like fifty dollars for a twelve ounce bottle was pretty rough for a lot of people, but they didn't realize how good this was going to be. Um, for something that sees a kind of retail Tavorish like type of release, it, it was putting up like a 4.8 on Untapped. And when we find when we had it on our show, I was like blown away. Um, simply because yes, it, it is expensive, but it's like. Uh, in the same way that uh, the phase three beer doesn't just take it straight to residual sugar, 19 Play-Doh, like Hershey syrup finish. This is like, it's almost like they had a stout that was like awesome, dialed in exactly what they wanted. And they just, they added power windows and leather seats to it to just, just push it even a little bit further. Cause the cask is there, the stout is there and the confectionery elements don't dominate. It's just like another aspect where you're like, God, this is crazy. It's so good. Uh, Maybe unpopular of me to say it, but I love that we live in a world where beer can command that kind of price. I think that, uh, you know, I mean, it sounds, I'm always amused to hear people complain about that, but I mean, the, I've got, you know, plenty of Cabernet Sauvignon bottles in the house that cost more than that. And I don't think twice about spending that on something that's a good, you know, bottle of wine. And my God, you wouldn't, don't want to know what I've spent on bourbon out there. Um, but certainly more than $50 for a 375 milliliter serving. Um, next up on your list. Finally, yet another collab. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's like this cross-pollination that creates these awesome results. But uh, uh, another thing that's kind of like a yin and a yang side project in private press brewing, uh, Maple in the Wood. Now, on the one hand, we have Corey King and Side Project, who's known for making those massive, over-the-top, BBT, derivation, those types of stouts. And those those have landed on you know, previous lists. So they're no stranger to my, my top 10. I do enjoy those. However, uh, when you take Brad Clark, who has now started private press brewing, uh, of Jackie O's fame, he, you know, has more of a, I would say classical, uh, transatlantic sort of con- you know, continental European approach to it, where it's like, it's, it's tightly drawn, not a ton of residual sugar, even some roastiness, uh, in, in the, some of his other stuff. And so when they took the two of those together, made like a crazy ultra saturated wheat wine, uh, and then also added this like element of maple to it. It was just like, it was all the drinkability of private press and Jackie O's, but then also the depth and complexity and expensive ass casks of side project. And when you merge those two, you're like, I can drink an entire 750 and the entire ride. I'm enjoying it which was like, that was exactly what I wanted from both of them. 
100%. I was actually drinking this while I did a podcast with Brad <laughs> in in the side project cellar um, right the day before the side project invitational, which was also back in February, back when I was able to travel. Uh, and so I also have very warm feelings about this. And so it was fun to see this pop up on your list. I agree. Brad's a, a rare talent and and a classicist who also just has that creative streak in him that's able to kind of blend both. Um, let's talk about some of the more kind of principled uh, elements of the, your critics list. One of the yeah. questions we threw out this year was today's drinkers should pay attention to. And my response was how breweries treat their employees. And just to kind of expound upon this a little bit, uh, you'll find that some of the best breweries have the best, most retained, taken care of front of house staff and uh, places that treat them like an Applebee's hostess, like if they have high turnover, it's telling about how they run the rest of their business. Like to the point that there's some breweries that almost have like iconic uh, tasting room servers that become part of the experience, like Nate from Modern Times and, you know, like Shay at Side Project. And like there's there are certain people that in their own right become tied to the brand. And I think that that shows like a deep river of how these people are being compensated. What is their interest in the company? Like, do they feel like, they're part of a team like is their compensation such that they won't just go and you know make twice as much somewhere else doing something they don't want to do like i just thought that that was really telling and people kind of forget that especially in this post covid world when a lot of people are struggling for sure for sure uh today's brewers should pay attention to um, I think that now we are coming into a segment of uh, I, I don't know if you would call them overlooked consumers or you know potentially just neglected in a lot of ways. Uh, I think that so much of the brewing world for two decades has focused on uh, you know like middle class white dudes with disposable income, twenty five to forty, and like that's you know every every can is a hip hop reference. Every you know it's like all of the references that are on labels seem to target a certain demographic, and I think we're seeing more and more um, like all of those like terrible cliches of the past, like fruited beers are for women or this or that, like. It's starting. That's unyoked. Everybody likes everything, and I think that you're going to see more concerted efforts from breweries across the board to get anybody in the tasting rooms, especially once they can reopen their doors. It's going to be like they have to really have to play up to their strengths and say, "Listen, we, like who likes saisons? We make saisons. We can get." these people in here like what type of events are we hosting where are we going what are we sponsoring beyond just beer fests like and who goes to beer fest who brings their friends and what types of friends do they bring uh, so basically short answer new consumers in new markets and i'm here for it for sure for sure promising thing that has come out of this year of covid so there's been a lax uh enforcement of shipping and and distro laws just because i feel like the state legislators who enforce these sometimes arbitrary blue laws uh, that are probably archaic and go back to the 1930s and benefit the three-tier system when we're seeing that dead hand control lift up a little bit um what i'm hoping is that we're going to see an examination of like why can't we ship in state why can't this happen why do we still we're not able to sell bottled beer here or why why must everything be in a crowler you know like uh it really is is widening things because these brewers are fighting for their lives and it really gives them leeway to say we shouldn't have to we shouldn't have to deal with this everything shouldn't have to go to a liquor store or whatever your state's flavor every state has like one of those like oh get this in our state we blah 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 that's how it is like so um i'm i'm curious to see if those roll back or change the sky is not going to fall just because people can buy alcohol in more liberal ways. Yeah. It's not going to be the end of humanity. I think we've <laughs> definitely proven that. But people being able to like take out mixed drinks from uh, their favorite restaurant is just not going to yeah. you know, cause the world to end. So let's just get over this kind of puritanical uh, approach to this and, yes. uh, and move forward with um, 
you know, and trust people to be adults. Thanks. Thanks again this year for your, uh, for your critics list five years in a row. And, uh, you know, if you want to go delve into Alex's past picks, you can find them all on beerandbrewing.com. Or, uh, if you're a subscriber to the magazine, which I assume you are, you can go dig into those archives and see the nicely designed pages with all of his, uh, his thoughts on there. So yeah, thanks for joining us, uh, uh with this, uh, critics list edition of the podcast and, uh, yeah, cheers, Alex. Thanks so much for having me. Cheers. That brings us to our final critics list of this special edition of the podcast. Joe, this one's yours. So uh, let's go talk through your 10 top 10 beers of 2020. Yeah, looking forward to this. Uh, what in these critics lists, they remind me of something, by the way. That, um, and I think it was actually Stan who first called my attention to this quote. Uh, which I'm going to have to paraphrase, but I think it was Eric Asimov, the wine writer, who talked about what an aficionado is. And it's somebody who can tell the difference between what's great and what they like. And which is not to say that our critics lists are not full of great beers, but it means we can sort of like a, a, with our editor's picks that you, that you and I work on. And of course, we get we get tons of input from the blind judging panel for that list, too. Um, those are beers f from as much as we're capable of being objective. Um, those are objectively great beers in our view, right? These are, this is just stuff we love. And I think that's, <laughs> I think that's really cool. You know, that we get to do that and it's sure, fun. Sure. So anyway, this is uh, your moment of indulgence where, uh, you know, you can, uh, flex as deep and as hard on exactly the things you want to. And, uh, and so your list can be unbalanced. It doesn't need to, uh, properly represent the broad world of beer. This is just all you. So, uh, start us off with, uh, the first beer on your list. Yeah. So this is something that, um, when, after the pandemic lockdowns, um, all these brewers are sitting on kegs, right? And so we're thinking, you know, put two and two together. We've got a home draft system at home for our home brews. Hey, let's, uh, let's buy some beer and kegs and let's have it on tap. And this is a more recent one that we had on tap. I know it's one of the more like unhealthy, but fun things that we've done all, all year <laughs> is put a keg of second shift two trains on tap yeah. up in our, up in our machine shed. And, um, it's just, I, it's, it just speaks to me. It's if there's, if Midwest coast is a thing, I think this is, this is it. It's got that malt, that caramel malt cushion. I generally have always preferred kind of double Imperial IPAs to straight IPAs. I find sometimes that extra malt makes them more balanced. Um, and they're, and they're naughty, you know, it's not like a drink one and well, actually it is you usually drink more than one. And that's kind of part of what makes them fun because you, you shouldn't, but um, and we're all is, professionals here. We're capable yeah, of doing there, this. There you go. But I mean, I've been known to drink big glasses of this one and I just, it, it's puts me to bed and I love it. Uh, but it, it, it's, you know, it's got that piney woodsy thing going on. There's enough, um, tropical fruit in the middle of it to, to keep it fun. Um, it's, it's sweet and it's bitter and it's round and it's bright and amber colored. And it's just, it's kind of what, you know, what I what I used to love about IPAs, this this beer hasn't changed all that much. It's been fine tuned over the years, and it's addictive and naughty and and delicious, and I love it. Well, there, there you go. go. What's yeah. uh, what's next up on your list? So um, my favorite hop lately is Laurel hops, um, lemony, very lemony, but just herbal enough to be serious, and uh, just to sort of like appeal to the sort of you know, noble, <laughs> the old, right. old world flavor, but with that bright lemonade kind of thing sure. going on. And uh, my favorite beer that, that featured that this year was um, American Solera's Laurel Roberts. And the Kolsch, you know, this beautifully brewed, light, refreshing Kolsch um, was the perfect sort of canvas for that lemony hop. And it made it just a really refreshing midsummer midsummer drink and another one i want to give a quick shout out to because i've been enjoying this a lot lately too is perennials um their prism is a single hopped saison series and this is what they did a laurel cryo version that was also that's also really nice but but this one i just really love the laurel roberts it was a really um, fun one for us to drink in the middle of hot summer for sure for sure now you stayed uh in the uh, german kind of sphere uh for the next beer on your list yeah, so everybody talks about the slow pour pills. I love that beer. It's you know it's a great pills. Um, I tend to like my my pilsners more bitter. Uh, 
which I'm we're gonna get to one of those later. But uh, my my favorite beer beer stat in Denver is the Hellis. Uh, you got people drinking their you know beautiful little um, doily glasses of Pilsner, and that's cool with the tall foam, and it's, it's it's gorgeous. But I'd rather just have that hefty half liter mug of the Hellis, and then have another after that, and another. Uh, I just it, it's a really totally convincing uh, Bavarian Hellas that that's got that pure clean malt sweetness, but then finishes dry, so you just want to keep drinking it. That's that's a really fun beer. So you uh, move into uh, Belgium for the beer after this on your list? Yeah, at least one more time. We're going to go to Belgium. Um, this is um, one of two Gurzes on the list we've got here. This one's from Bone, the Vat One Ten. This is one where where um, I was looking at my notes and the scores that I give a beer, and and um, I might kind of have my own like method when I'm tasting beers at home, and it I almost never drop five stars on the beer the first time I have it. But this was one that I did that. And um, it may be a little bit of just missing being able to drink these beers as often as I used to, um, ha- you know, not being in Europe anymore. But sure. um, but it, it just it just hit everything right. And it's just, you know, um, Frank Bone is is a master. And this was just another one of his little no big deal. <laughs> it's just another great Bone Grizz. And I know other, um, you know, the, the, the nerds go crazier over – other brewers and blenders a little bit more than than bone or, or out bears which is also going to be on my list but but um i just good price good quality great complexity easy to drink um this one it's it's got that sour grapefruit squeeze to it you got the that dryness and sparkle like cobwebs on the palate totally dry very light on the palate considering it's eight percent abv um, it's just, it's just, uh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. What's next on your list? Uh, an old friend, uh, out of Kansas city, the Boulevard pale ale. I just think it's the most underrated pale ale in the country. No big deal. Um, <laughs> just <ever. laughs> yeah, I just love the beer and it's fine. You know, I, I'm not going to dispute how great Sierra Nevada's pale ale is, um, or uh, lots of other ones out there for that matter. But this one, it just, it's one I got to have every time I'm, I'm back home and I keep it around all the time. It, the, it's got that little caramel biscuit malt middle to it uh, that holds it together. Uh, where you know a lot of pale ales in recent years have gone paler and paler, basically blonde and drier. That's fine. This is pretty dry too, though. And um, it's but it's got just this little f- grapefruity fruit punch middle to it that's always been there. Um, and I think it's another. It, it, I just um, I don't know. It's just a comfort. Sure, sure. Next up on your list is a, a totally underexposed brewery that no one's hearing about anywhere else in this <laughs> best in beer issue. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm just kidding about that. Um, but you had a different take. You uh, wanted to celebrate a different beer from Grains of Wrath for this next one. Well, yeah. Well, so Grains of Wrath um, first came on our radar for their uh, Vienna Lager earlier this year. And then they sent us some other beers, too. It just and, happened to be the same issue that was our, our annual IPA issue, and they're like, "Oh, hey, we'll you know send you some some IPAs along to review also." And uh, that was just kind of a interesting twist of fate. Yeah. Huh? Well, they killed it with our blind panel. We loved them. Then they went and got a gold medal from GABF last week. That was nice. Uh, and and then this was, I mean, again, going just by my own scores at home, this was my favorite IPA of the year. So this was Grains of Wrath Dystopia. Uh, our pick, um, based and you know this because our blind panel loved it so much, was the Crypt Keeper. Also great. Uh, this is their best seller. This is their like flagship IPA, and um, it, it's and then just... of course Built for Speed was uh, was the gold medal winner at uh, GABF <laughs> now. Yeah, so right. A third beer. Yeah, yeah. yeah w- which they had won medals two years in a row for that Vienna Lager too. Yeah, got to mention that. So I would love to. I want to go there and sit there and get to know all the lagers better. Um, you know, next time I'm in the Portland area, which, you know, knock on wood, let's, let's have a great year in 2021. Um, but this one just, it's, it's got the nose on it and the juicy middle, um, reminded me of a lot of the hazier, thicker stuff that's around right now. Um, but it's bright and crisp and bitter. Um, but it's bitter without having that resinous tone cutting, you know, tongue coating stuff that makes it harder to, to keep drinking. It's quite easy to keep drinking. It's delicious and addictive. So back to Belgium for your next beer. Right. So, um, and this was, you know, maybe a divisive beer. I don't know. 
Um, but from Oud Berzel, their Oud Goose Barrel Selection Fooder 21. I'm not even going to try to say 21 in, uh, in Flemish. Um, so, again, you know, I, I mentioned before, you know, the American Lambic lovers tend to go for Cantillon big time, which is fine. Or Dry Fontaine too. Also great. Um, but I always try to keep Oud Berzel around. Uh, because it's a good price, even here, um, and it's it's underrated. For me, it's always been underrated, uh, and particularly that that the creek is so juicy. I just I really enjoy that one. Um, and this was completely different. Um, these are it's blended from older barrels of lambic, um, four plus years, uh, in white wine barrels, and it's got this like riesling like uh, stripe running through it. And that that su- almost sweetness from the wine, and the and the and the the blender, um, yeah, he says that it's uh, a a Madeiraization, like Madeira, where it, uh, there's some uh, a little bit of heat applied and a little bit of oxidation, and that may be what brings out that softness and sweetness. I don't know, but for me, it works, um, and it softens up the beer. Uh, that little bit of sweet impression makes it a bit rounder to me. And it reminds me of another old favorite of mine, the, the Cantillon Vigneron, which has the, the Muscat grapes in it. Um, just um, a really gorgeous beer. And it's it's one that um, we I went back for a couple times um, at the uh, Big Beers Festival in Breckenridge. Just really enjoyed it. And then found some locally and, and drank more. Fantastic. Um, next up, Port City. Yeah. Oh, man. I love this beer. I, I like talking about this beer. I like talking about Port City in general, just to sure, just to, sure. just to like a, a great technically so solid brewery, right? Um, and so many good beers come out of that uh, that brewery in Virginia and Alexandria. Um, and but this one, I don't know, it might be my favorite. It it, it comes out in winter, and it's uh, it's a black IPA. I mean, do you remember those? I, I remember them vaguely. Yeah. Anyway, it, 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 so they they are still making this beer. Yeah, they, they still make this beer. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and I guess some people look forward to it. I definitely, and I'm going to be looking forward to it every year now. Uh, and it's, um, they're, so they're, maybe I, I, maybe I misspoke when I said their favorite, this is my favorite beer because their porter is so good. Right. It's right. got that richness and balance to it. Uh, that little just caramel in the middle that holds it all together. You know, it's not overly austere. It's got that little bit of uh, indulgence in there, just a bit to keep it all together. Um, and the long black veil. I think it must be made from a similar base, um, but it's got this minty, piney, uh, uh, woodsy depth from the hops um, where it's, you know, when it's fresh, it's pretty bitter, in a, in, in the, but there's enough malt to carry that. Uh, and what I found was we, because we kept some bottles around and had it um, maybe 10 months later. And it was still really good. It had rounded out nicely. Um, and it was, I don't know if it was better, but it was, it was still delicious. And it's just, a, you know, just a indication of how well brewed those beers are that, that that beer could hold up so well. For sure. So next on your list was one I was not surprised to see. It's one that uh, we, <laughs> we routinely see on um, brewers pick six lists. Yeah, it could be on. It could probably be on my critics list every year. Um, but the Taras Bulba from Brasserie de la Seine in Brussels. Um, it's you know it's just one of my top five beers of all time, um, maybe top you know two or three, maybe top one. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and, but it's they had this also in uh, on tap in Breckenridge right. when we were there um, back in January, and um, that was really uh, nice because it was a perfect like thing to cleanse the palate between barley wines and and uh, big stouts and stuff. It's the, so I think I went back to that. Um, you know, the little importer stand like five times just right. to get another little, they had it on draft. It was like, oh man, so, so nice. And I used to drink the hell out of this beer when I lived in Brussels and I would get it whenever I could when I lived in Germany. And, and, um, so that was nice to have. And it was an easy, easy one to slide into uh top 10 of the year. Yeah. Yeah. What's the last beer on your list? Yeah. I mentioned bitter Pilsners earlier. Um, and, um, it, my local go-to for that is the urban chestnut Stammtisch. Um, a lot of pilsners are, you know, smooth, well balanced, still plenty of, uh, you know, hop character to it. Ideally, this one is bitter. I don't think it's smooth. It's got a ruggedness to it that I that I really enjoy and want to come back to. It's about forty IBUs, um, and I just, you know, I just find that addictive. Um, it's not a resinous, harsh bitterness. It's a very herbal. 
uh, you know, classic Holler Tower type bitterness. Um, and I, I think you can make an argument that the the Zwickel, which I also fully enjoy, is objectively a better beer in a lot of ways um, because of that ruggedness. Um, but uh, for me, I just prefer this one. This is one I, I, I don't, it's not as available as I would like it to be, um, but I grab it whenever I can. For sure. Um, in terms of the questions posed to all the critics on our list, today's drinkers should pay attention to... Well, I'm worried for uh, smaller breweries right now, and I think we got to uh, do what we can to support them. And I mean smaller. Um, your, um, you know, your favorite regional breweries or, or uh, somewhat larger size small breweries that are able to get onto supermarket shelves, they're probably going to be all right. Um, the beer, breweries that are able to get packaged beer onto supermarket shelves this year are in a better position than the ones who uh, were much more reliant on their tap rooms. Right. And have shifted to to go. And that's still basically how they're surviving is to go beer. And I, we need to support those if you want them to be around next year. So I think we got to pay attention to that. Uh, what should today's brewers pay attention to? Uh, flagships and fine tuning. Um, I know that we're not normal beer drinkers. Um, that when we say we're tired of this constant revolving door of variety that we're not like most people who come in and all want that next tick or want that next new new thing for untapped i get that but um i think you have to play both sides of it and um the beers that people are going to keep coming back to are those that you keep working on and working on and i don't really believe in it in a beer ever being perfected people's tastes are going to change too so have your few beers that you count on and rely on and that your your customers can rely on and just keep tweaking and tweaking until until uh, well no just keep doing it actually this has been a good year for flagships it was pretty much an entire year of flagships uh, and as a return of some of these big flagships um and just you know massive upsides to those as people went back for stuff that was uh, familiar and that uh, that they could count on and so you know Hopefully we will see some uh, you know continued balance between that uh, you know constant perfecting of these or I shouldn't say perfecting not perfection a constant uh, attempt at perfecting and continuing uh, work on these beers at the same time as uh, breweries also focus on creating those spaces for new experiences and exploration um, a promising thing that's come out of this year of COVID nineteen. Well, I don't know when it's going to happen next year, if it's going to be earlier or later, but things will, right. things will open up again. Um, and I, I just think that when it does, um, we're really going to appreciate being around people again. Right. Uh, and I mean, being in crowded dive bars and um, being able to sit at the bar of your you know, favorite um, beer bar or tap room and just annoy the bartender and ask lots of questions and, and to give, you know, give hugs again and all that and go to concerts, all that stuff. Sure. I just think we're, I think we're really going to appreciate that again. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of us are appreciating it right now uh, when we get the chance, but it's going to be next year uh, sometime. And I'm looking forward to that. I don't, it, we, I hear a lot of people say, Oh, it's never going to be the same. Well, that's true in some ways, but in other ways it's going to be, uh, I think we're going to go back the other way and maybe even overcompensate in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot wait for that moment. What are your big predictions for 2021? Well, I'm, I love lager and I like a lot of brewers, right? Uh, we, we love lager. So uh, I like seeing that trend uh, be commercially successful. So I, we're going to see more of that, I hope. And I think, but in the meantime, I also think that um, the West Coast IPA is going to make a bit of a comeback. I think we're seeing that already to some degree. Sure. Um, and notably, comeback. The, it's been here for years. Well, exactly Joe. right. I mean, our, in our Reader's Choice Awards the past two years, the in our West Coast IPA is more popular than the hazy, juicy ones. So, for sure. you know, um, just barely, but it's it edging it out. Um, and so, I think if you think about those two trends in in in, uh, in tandem. Then we may see more um, aggressively hopped lagers, and I think that would be good fun. Not like maybe the IPLs of yesteryear, which a lot of times had some rough hopping and and, and a big body to it, just like the IPAs used to. But but right. lighter and crisper, um, you know, lighter framed things that are uh, 
full of hop flavor and aroma. Enough bitterness, but but easy to drink. I think that's going to be really fun. I think that's happening. All right, that brings us to the end of our critics lists. Um, thanks to everyone who's joined us, uh, Joe and me, for this episode. It's been fun to talk with everyone, and uh, you know, super fun in this time of social distancing and uh, and social isolation to just hop on and drink some beers and talk about those uh, great beers this past year um nearly 2,000 breweries across the u.s canada and mexico partner with gnd chillers get haze for days with carry bio haze inquire about a free craft brew sample pack from five star chemicals and supply grandstand is your one-stop shop for drinkware apparel and promotional items abs commercial is giving away a keg viking keg washer live on december 5th and subscribe now to craft beer and brewing to get full access to this year's best in beer issue right now we'll be back next week with another episode of the craft beer and uh, brewing podcast uh until then from uh from both of us joe thanks for uh for uh talking and sharing some thoughts thank you jamie and thanks to all the brewers who submitted beers and to our writers too for uh, for giving us their uh, input uh we'll be back again next week cheers cheers This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.